blew the sign out front, right? And I, I like that sign. You know, how are we going to ask God to open doors, close doors, if we're hanging on to the doorknob? You know, and, and that's kind of where, where our messages are going. And how do we reach out to people? And how do we encourage people? Now, I was talking to Justin before church, and he was telling me about a friend of his at Roseville. He's been reaching out to and encouraging to come and join us for months even. And uh, he, he did a great job because now the guy's going to First Baptist in Roseville. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he is. Amen, sister. That's, and once again, I want to tell you, we're not concerned about growing our church. We are worried about growing God's kingdom. And let God put who he wants in our midst. But we got to go out. How are we going to approach these folks? How are we going to reach these folks? And this is a, our, our scripture today, in, which will be in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And it's a, maybe an interesting way to, to approach how to, how to approach folks. Is, is what we want to look at this morning as we get ready to go out and, and uh, visit with people and, and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, we're going to look at the difference between the way the world approaches folks and the way Jesus approaches folks this morning. And so today is really about the approach, and yes, I entitled it defenseless, because we are all defenseless. Aren't we? we are defenseless before Christ. We have no we, we can make up all the reasons and excuses and alibis and everything, but we're defenseless before Christ. We are defenseless. But in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, and this is a touchy subject, and, you know, we have to deal with some things, but uh, just bear with us. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on and sin no more, most gracious Father. God, we very humbly bow this morning to your very presence, God, because you have promised that you would be here. Father God, I ask you to take these words this morning and open my mind. To your teaching today, Father, that I may share with this congregation, Father, as you have placed me in a position of leadership and stewardship over this congregation, Father, I beg you today to give me the words to say that uh, our hearts will be touched and our lives will be changed and that we will know more about you and know more about how to share your love. chances that we overlook, but Father, we ask you to give us boldness, go and share. Father, teach me now, show me your word, in your name I pray, amen. 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 Interesting story, is it, in, the fact that the woman is an adulteress, is that important in this story? No. Nope, it ain't. That's just happened. 
happens to be the sin of the moment. And she was caught red-handed. And I looked it up. You know where the terminology red-handed comes from? It began in Scotland back in the 1400s. And it meant that you still had the blood on your hand. Okay? It was concrete evidence. She has been caught in the very act of adultery. She has no defense. There, I mean, it, it's like... The, the guy coming out of the bank with the ski mask, the gun, and the <coughs> sack of money under his arm, and the policeman standing right there catching him as he comes out the door. There, there's no defense. Guilty. She's guilty. Right? And here comes the world. Look you here, Jesus. Look what we got. We've got this. Well, she is guilty. She is guilty. We like to pile on, don't we? We like pointing our fingers, don't we? We like going after folks. Why do we why do we do that? Well, let's look at these folks. Why were they doing this? Well, number one, they were saying that they were trying to uphold in girls, uh, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. Would one of y'all look that up for me, please? Levit and that's, I know that's one of them hard ones to find. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus 20, chapter 10. Or verse 10. Chapter 20, verse 10. But, they were trying to sanctify themselves to say they were upholding the holy and righteous law of God. God's law said, remember that's what they said here? God's law said. So is that really what they were doing? Is that what they were doing? Have you found it? Okay, Brittany? If there is a man who commits adultery... Deal. 
look self-righteous. I make myself look so sanctimonious. That I can get my nose up so high in there that it rained a half inch of ground. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what the world is ready to do. The world is ready to just jump on pile on it and condemn everybody. We can find fault with everybody we come into contact with. You know, I can find fault with Kenny back here. Oh, no. He's a truck driver. I mean, you ever, you ever heard the like? I mean, you know what truck drivers are like, right? Woo! Wild and crazy. Man. They can tell some tales. But what does this demonstrate? We were, our, you know, when we break the law down into two commandments, it's to love God. Love our neighbor. And if I'm sitting here and I'm denigrating and I'm running down and I'm piling on and I'm pointing my finger and I'm uh, condemning you, what's that doing? I'm not sharing love with my neighbor, am I? I'm not showing you the love of God, am I? And what's the problem with this? What becomes the problem when we get so high and mighty and self righteous and sanctimonious and fulfilling our own agenda? What is wrong? Because, see, we're already condemned. The whole world is condemned. We need to look up John 3, 18, and Matthew 7 and 2. And those two scriptures, girl. Sin is sin. And as you so wisely stated, it didn't matter that her sin was adultery. That's a very obvious and very visible sin that we uh, appreciate today, right? I mean, we can see that. We all know that's bad. But what about, you know, the little guy? or the, the underhanded business techniques that we have or just the uh, uncaring for other people. Those are sins also, y'all. And sin is sin. And that's what Jesus does. He calls the, the crowd. And we got this crowd. This, it's that mob mentality. They all come together. They all pile on. Oh, yeah, looky here, looky here. Oh, yeah, we, you know. They're after this woman. says she's to be stoned, that whoever is without sin cast the first stone. And you know, if we'll stop and we'll look at ourselves, we, we, we try to justify lots of things in our mind. Don't we? we justify most of our activities. We justify everything that we try to do. Justify it to ourselves. Even though we know it probably ain't right, we can justify it. Well, everybody else is doing that, or well, it was just so I could feed my children, or well, it was so, whatever the purpose, whatever the reason. We justify it to ourselves. But when we're faced with the Holy Spirit, and we truly stop. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has already been judged because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He who does not believe has been judged already. We are condemned. We are condemned. You realize that? We've already been condemned. Before we ever were born, sin. That's our nature is sinful. And so we're condemned. So how can I point my finger at you when your pastor knows how worthless and sinful he is? And if I'm worthless and sinful, then I'm supposed to be the holy man, right? more righteous than I am. You know, we we got to keep things in perspective. Have you had a chance to look up Matthew 7 and 2? This is the, this is the real kicker, Matthew 7 and verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall
shall be judged. And with what measure ye mete? Meet it out. M E T E. Meet. Yes. It shall be measured to you again. Okay. So, however you're judging other folks is how you're going to be judged. Stop and think about this. How do you want to be judged? How do you want to be? How do you, how do you want to come stand before God? How do you want to stand before man? And however you're looking at other men, if you're holding them up to this really, really high level, this really, really high standard that you don't hold yourself to, God's going to hold you to that same standard. So when we're looking at one another, when we're trying to point our fingers at one another, guess what? Not only are we condemned already, but we are heaping coals on ourselves because we are elevating the level of judgment that God is going to have on us. Now that's scary, isn't it? We can be pretty harsh, can't we? You know, here was these folks, they was, they was being pretty harsh with this lady. They done got the rocks in their hand. They fixed to start chunking. And you know what happens when you go to chunking rocks. Something's going to get broke here in a minute, right? Just ask Charlie and Casey. They start chunking rocks. What's going to happen? The front window's going, ain't it? Okay? But we are condemned. Through, just through our very nature. <coughs> and, but, you know, what is sin? Well, you know, we can list a lot of things. Well, you know, it's drunkenness. It's adultery. It's, you know, we've got the Ten Commandments that, that list sins. But what a, sin is anything that is contrary to God. You know, it would be a sin for me to stand here in this pulpit and try to preach to this congregation if God did not want me. If he wanted me to be in another church somewhere else, it would be a sin for me to be here today. It's not what we're doing. It's why we're doing what we're doing. It's our heart. And if it's contrary to what God's called us to do, that's sin. We, we like to paint sins, don't we? we? We've got our list of, of sins, things you don't do, you know, right? We we. We can print that up, write that out, and you don't do these things. We, we, but that's not always what Paul's sins are. If you're a member of this church and God wants you to be a member of a different church, you need to go be over there. You don't need to be where God don't want you to be. Or if you're a fine, successful, honest businessman, and yet God's calling you to the mission field, oh, that's a sin. For him who knows, and James... For him who knows what is right and does not do it, that is a sin also. Knowing the right thing, it's not that you've done anything, it's that you ain't done something. We're just as guilty for what we don't do as for what we do. And so we're condemned. We're just as guilty as this woman. In the eyes of God, sin is sin. Remember that. Sin is sin. It doesn't Man categorizes it with little sins and big sins, don't we? You know, murder's a whole lot worse than than adultery, and adultery is worse than cheating on your taxes. And, but it's all sin, isn't it? And what does sin do? Sin separates us from God. You know, we're all sinners. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, wages is what we earn, that's our weekly paycheck, right? It's what we earn for what we've done. The wages of sin is death. But, you know, it's always got a but in there, don't it? But the free gift of God, not what you've earned, not what you deserve, is sin has done for us. It has separated us. It condemned us. We're condemned already. And as we judge others, so will we also be judged. So if I'm sitting here holding you up to this high esteem, so when we start, you know, and we 
good all the time. We go, them deacons over there, they just, they are to, they are to live this way. That's okay if I don't, but they are to live this way. Right? We do that? Anybody ever done that? Well, he's a deacon down there. Yeah, he's, 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 or he's the pastor down there in that church. Or he teaches Sunday school over at that church. Look how he's acting. Don't do that. Get that little snooty, self-righteous Smiling, y'all. Y'all, y'all look like y'all experienced that before, hadn't you? Yes, Deacon Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so the world is ready to just pound some. The world is ready to condemn anybody and everybody. But the world is actually condemned already. How does Jesus respond to that? What is His response? To She's defenseless before Jesus. He is the, actually the only one there who can condemn her. And how does he respond? What does he show to her? Grace. He shows her mercy. He shows her love. He shows her forgiveness. That's what we need. Do we also? That's what we need because we're condemned already. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Kelsey, you look this one up, okay? I'm about where I've written these fingers out. Romans 8, 1 and 2. I love this set of scriptures. I just have to know you had your Bible with you this morning. So I'll repeat it right now, okay? <laughs> That's what being free from that law, the Mosaic law said, this is what's going to happen. But now under Christ, we are no longer condemned. If we believe, if we accept Christ, we are no longer condemned. That's where that but came in in Romans 6, 23. You remember the one that says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ his Son. Because what we deserve is death. Here's what Jesus offered. He offers mercy. Not giving her what she does deserve. The law said she deserves death, right? And she deserves that, but he's not giving that to her. He offers her grace. Gives her what she doesn't deserve. He offers her a new life. Life everlasting. Right? He offers her forgiveness for sins because she is defenseless. She is a sinner. He offers forgiveness for that sin before Almighty, holy, righteous God. He offers her love and compassion. Where are you? What did they offer her? Where is everybody? Does no one condemn you? What sweeter words can someone hear? Neither do I condemn you. The only one who could, the only one who is capable, the only one qualified to condemn. relate to a witnessing technique. Number one, don't be condemning them. Don't be pointing your finger at them and telling them what they're doing is wrong. What did Jesus do? He forgave. He showed grace. He showed mercy. And then he says, then he says, go and sin no more. Change your we don't need to go up to folks and point our finger and you need to quit drinking, you need to quit smoking, you need to quit chasing women, you need to quit this, you need to quit that, right? See, we got it. We got it down. That finger's going to poke somebody in the eye if we ain't careful, right? We, that's what we want to do. You need to get to know Jesus because you can quit. And, and that's what we do. 
isn't he? That's, that's how it, that's <coughs> the way Jesus does it. Jesus comes with wisdom, with grace, with mercy, with love, compassion, forgiveness, all of these attributes. And that's what we need to have in our heart for the lost around us. Let Jesus change them. Let Jesus show them what needs to be different in their life. We just need to show them the way to Jesus and not come at them condemned because how can I condemn you when I'm condemned already also for my sin? The only thing that makes me different from a lost person is I know Jesus Christ. Amen. And the only thing that makes you different from a lost person is your knowledge of Jesus Christ. So how come we get to just power? We need to watch our approach for the lost in this world, don't we? We need to be careful of how we come up to people. If we are just like the rest of the world, condemning them for everything that they've done, if we're just like the rest of the world, looking down our nose at them, pointing our finger at them, how can we expect them to see anything different in us that would make them want to know Jesus? But if we come in with the grace and the love and the mercy and all that long list of things, those attributes that Jesus brings to that situation, then they will see that there's something different about Jesus. There's something different about us. And so when we are approaching people, when we are out talking to folks, when we are out telling them what a great congregation this church is, when we are about telling them about how much they need Jesus Christ, we need to do it the way Jesus does. We need to approach them in a way that honors him, that ex exemplifies him. We are his example. So look at yourself this morning. First of all, do you know Jesus? Have you ever come before him and, and received Big sin. 